This week, John Pescatori, Director of Emerging Security Trends, joins us to talk about mostly his random career choices that led to a long and fun career in cybersecurity, and how that ties into today's demand to secure the increasing complexity of supply web of chains. In the security news, scoring WordPress vulnerabilities and map load balancers, no explo known exploited vulnerabilities, chaining Zoom bugs, finding hidden devices, ethical hackers can keep hacking, Kubernetes on the internet, open source DIY encryption, don't count vulnerabilities, fake Windows exploits, libraries under attack, vulnerability hoaxes, and fighting ransomware with pictures of your junk. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. Right now, everybody is talking about cryptocurrency, and the cyber criminals are hiding in the conversation. Cyber criminals use social engineering, loaded with urgency and fear, to successfully prey on your company, your employees, and your customers. Spear phishing is just one of 13 types of email threats. Barracuda has identified these 13 types and shows you how you can protect your company, your customers, and your reputation. Find out about the 13 email threat types and Barracuda email protection. Get your free ebook at security securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda that's securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda and now i am your host paul asadorian where the show must go on welcome everyone to paul's security weekly it's episode number 742 recorded may 25th 2022 right here in g unit studios in rhode island barely being recorded as we figure it all out mr tyler robinson is here with us remotely tyler welcome yeah, just you and I, buddy, holding down the fort with uh, the new amazing production crew. Man, you guys, right. you guys are really hard on those interns. I'm just saying. Like, hey, you want to just produce all the shows? That'd be great. Thanks. Uh, so uh, we have um, a new set of hosts that will join us for the next segment. Uh, to throw another monkey wrench in there, we're playing musical hosts as well. Um, don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe. Subscribe to all of our podcast feeds and have episodes downloaded right to your device. You can also join our mailing list, Discord server, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms, as well as check out our episode starter packs, which are on the subscriber page, uh, which are on Spotify, which is uh, a list of uh, archived episodes from the, from the archives that uh, we put together for you. Joining us for this interview, John Pescatori. John joined SANS, the SANS Institute in 2013 with 35 years of experience in computer network and information security. He was Gartner's lead security analyst for 13 years, worked as a consultant for Entrust Technologies, and spent 11 years with GTE developing secure computing and telecommunication systems. Even before that, John worked for the NSA, where he designed secure voice systems and the Secret Service, where he developed secure communications and surveillance systems. John is also an extra class amateur radio operator, call sign K3TN. K3TN, welcome to the show. Thanks. I could reply in Morse code. I wonder if you'd lose your audience. Perhaps. Perhaps. If we, we haven't already. <laughs> no, they're still with us because they want to hear what John has to say for sure. John, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. John, other than what I described in your bio, how did you get your start in information security? Well, my whole career has sort of been a series of random random decisions. I, when I was graduating high school, my, grad, my uh, counselor said, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to be a cameraman for NFL football games. She told me, okay, you have to go to college for electrical engineering, which made no sense at all. I said, <laughs> okay. Did that, and then when it was time to um, interview for uh, as in my senior year, had to buy a suit and a tie and do all these interviews. And in the recruitment center, they put up a sign interview with the National Security Agency, which I'd never heard of. You don't need to wear a tie. Mm -hmm. So oh, cool. Okay. An interview, interview with them. They flew me and some others down over Christmas break to take a polygraph test and a psychological profile test to see if we could qualify to be work at a super secret agency. And they offered me the job, and my girlfriend at the time said, take that one. I want to go to Georgetown to law school. So I said, okay, I'll take that job. 
this was a sleepy time at NSA. It was the late 70s. You know, the mm -hmm. Vietnam War was over. All it was was spying mm -hmm. on the Russians. But I got to, got to play with some high technology stuff, do some hands-on hardware, got to learn about cryptography. And I actually, uh, a, little, a while ago, Bruce Schneier posted some things that NSA declassified its internal newsletter, which was called Cryptolog. Mm. And uh, I looked back for the first month I was there, June of 78, and there was an article on buffer overflows in operating system software wow. back in 1978, which at the time meant the MVS mainframe operating system. Right. So you think about 78 and it wasn't long after that, that Windows was going to be built and build in all kinds of new buffer overflows that would get exploited in the early 2000s. Well, after about a, well, about two years, it was kind of slow and it was nothing but technology that was going to be used to spy on the Russians who weren't really doing very high tech stuff at the time. A friend called who had left NSA and went to the Secret Service and said, hey, over the weekend, one of the guys in our office got killed in a car crash who should apply for his job. Good so Lord, the, that's morbid. <laughs> so I took advantage of that morbid situation and, and um, went to the Secret Service Technical Development and Planning Division. We were the 12 engineers for the Secret Service. The Secret Service, you know, its main mission was really chasing counterfeiters because it was under Treasury Department. And the protective stuff was the showy part that really came up every four years when there were elections and more people to protect and so on. But we got to do a bunch of stuff. We got to do protective trips and advanced trips looking for bugs in hotel rooms and looking for bombs and things like that. But my technical areas were around secure communications, encrypted radios for the agents back in then. This was in the you know, 1980s when encryption was barely defined. And um, we were sort of building our own stuff. And NSA was looking at what we did to make sure it wasn't too secure that they couldn't listen in. <laughs> but also surveillance. Uh, I got to play around. You, you said I was a ham radio operator. Got to play around with putting bugs in hotel rooms that talked out on RF and how to be built into lamps and other weird things. and. Got to do actual surveillances of uh, counterfeiters and work live cases and do wiretaps and things. So it was a real introduction into the law enforcement side of things and the surveillance side and all the constraints we put on the surveillance side of things in the name of privacy and minimization that people don't think about that. This was after Nixon and the Watergate stuff. There was lots of privacy laws put back put, put back in then hmm. that really limited our country's uh, ability to do internal surveillance, to detect internal threats. And I was having a great time doing that. And then Hinckley shot Reagan. Mm -hmm. And we had one guy in our office who was the materials engineer. And he did bulletproof armor. And he got swamped. He needed help. And I was single. I was willing to travel. I knew how to work a circular saw and do basic carpentry that we often had to do to put these things together. So I really spent a couple of years mostly flying around, putting in bulletproof armor in crazy places like the Super Bowl and baseball all-star game and covered wagons at political rallies in Utah. And after that, I said, this is kind of fun, but I can't see doing this the rest of my life with my electrical engineering degree. So I went to private industry to a, a, what turned out to be GT government systems, a SIGINT. Uh, signals but John, and just back up for a moment. Uh, around that time, was Secret Service getting involved in uh, computer crime investigations? Because they were one of the early agencies to do that, no? Yeah, they were they were involved in the uh, automated clearinghouse type, you know, bank to bank transfers mm -hmm. of uh, funding. And they had that responsibility that years later got them more and more into cybersecurity as Treasury became more than just, you know, bank to bank transfers that they they watched over. So, yeah, that was the start. That was the that was the start of the tiny little Secret Service tried to compete with the FBI for the charter of cybersecurity and the civilian side of the government. Yeah, I, I remember that I was. Um... I was at university in early like 2000 and my security contact primarily was someone from the secret service. Yeah, they were the first. And then the uh, FBI was a much bigger, much bigger agency with a lot more money and captured the charter over the years. Mm. So, so I went to be a Sorry, second yeah, contact. Back to your story. Then you went to private industry. And uh, the very first project I worked on was a huge NSA job to basically build a large VAX based system that had to operate at multi-level security levels, B2 security. So this was in the mid eighties when we first started thinking about how to secure operating systems. And we thought the way to do it was to certify an operating system, to give it these arcane requirements, what had to be built into a complex operating system as if it was a single piece of software. That approach never worked, but it sort of introduced me early on to the very uh, 
very arcane issues of software security, which mm -hmm. were sort of not being talked about at all at the time. And that's when the PC came along. And but Vax at that time was VMS? Vax was VMS, and there was actually a security enhanced version of VMS mm -hmm. that was supposed to be B2 um, certified by NSA and be the first sort of commercial secure operating system. And then HP, HP UX followed afterwards, but mm -hmm. the time it took to certify them, the operating system was five versions in the future from what was certified. So it was, you know, total, totally useless effort, but pointed, pointed out what not to do that we sort of learned late, later on. Right. Like Telnet, I mean, Telnet was the way you got on those systems. Telnet was about it. There was, <clears> there was no, um, there was no things like ethernet. The ethernet wasn't standard. There was a thing called decknet, which mm -hmm. was a deck pro proprietary thing. So we look back at, at the things like VMS and think as well, that was, was way more secure than windows. And, well, it really wasn't, you know, the, the Morris worm in 89 took advantage of a bunch of vulnerabilities and, both VMS and, and Unix mm -hmm. and broke into, broke into everything. So from there, I, after about 10 years of doing government contracting, I started to get bored, look for opportunities, started thinking I want to do freelance writing. So I spent a lot of time learning how to write well, and I found I enjoyed it. I communicated well. I got to do a lot of red team reviews of designs and things at GT since I've been there a long time, both on the commercial side. Back then, the red team was not the pen testers. The red team was who reviewed your design or your proposal or your software before it would be released to go production. Yeah, it was and more that, like a threat modeling exercise at that point. Yeah, and in the software side, that wasn't even thought about really, the fact that there might be threats because nothing was connected to anything. It was all internal. You mostly <clears> thought <throat> about the good old CIA hierarchy of, I mean, a triad of confidential integrity availability in the form of access control of users and internal users and the like. Um, so I, I jumped to a job that I was more of an analyst and uh, started doing more writing and more analysts around communications. ATM networks were exploding, and that was supposed to be the wave of the future. And the boss came to me and said, you know, we got to deliver a bunch of reports on security. Would you mind doing them? And that was sort of my career switch that focused completely on security uh, versus networks and all kinds of other stuff. And, and then uh, TIS, Trusted Information Systems, was the first firewall company. It was a local company here in Maryland. I knew the owner. He said, hey, I got fun stuff to do. I could use somebody like you. You want to come work for us? And that was right when the Gauntlet Firewall was turning into a commercial product. It mm. started out as an open source product, started out as a government project that Marcus, Marcus and Raymond and others um, sort of pushed along and turned it into a product. And so that was the start of, I went to them in the start of the firewall market. And I got involved in seeing how commercial businesses differed in their security need from the government. And that that was a real eye opener because TIS was a market leader with the most secure proxy firewall. Mm. And Checkpoint came along with the, hey, here's a GUI. We have a firewall with a GUI and it does a thing called stateful and it's not as intrusive and it's not as resource intensive as proxies. And of course, TIS was proxies are the only way to go. That's mm -hmm. the only secure way. And it, I really, been, I was doing a lot of consulting with businesses, helping them architect how to put a firewall in. It was such a uh, a strange thing for them to block anything at that communicating with them, what they needed to do. But that was a real happen. And unfortunately, TIS got bought by the evil network associates. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew that wasn't going to go well. So there, I'd really had an interest in encryption from working in NSA and doing encryption. So I went to Entrust, who was sort of the leader in public key infrastructure back in the day. Unfortunately, I saw the same thing when I got there. They were very religious about secure, about encryption and PKI and the 12 things you must do to do PKI. And I was working with big insurance companies and consulting, helping them figure out how to do encryption. And they couldn't do all 12 things. They just needed to solve a few problems. You know, like a, a bank was doing business in Africa and it, 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 uh, you couldn't trust the telecoms in Africa because the government spied on them. So you had to send all your, your financial closure information back to the States by courier. And the, uh, that would take two days mm -hmm. and you had to borrow the money at the Fed overnight fund rate to close these <clears throat> transactions until the paperwork came and then you could get reimbursed. So one trader was costing him $12 million out of his business unit a year to pay the Fed overnight fund rates to borrow because they had to use courier, physical courier services. He heard about it. He went to the RSA conference, actually mm -hmm. heard about encryption. He called the trust. And so we found out that hey, here's a business justification of encryption. You know, this is back in, right. back in the, uh, mid 90s, you know, so th th to me, that's a really important thing for a lot of people to think about as they go through their career, you know, we get wrapped up in everything has to be done in security this way. And once you start getting involved in businesses, you start seeing that risk trade off. 
you know, we can't do all 12 things. What if we only did 12, 10 things and we took a risk in these two? Could I still save my $12 million? And um, so 30, 30 years later, we still have the same problems is what you're saying. We, mm-hmm. we can't do all 12 things and we're still fighting the business needs and business risks. And that is still a problem. <laughs> yeah. And I think the biggest part of that problem is we 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 sort of got ca- got caught up in this industry of, well, a new thing will come along and solve all those problems, you know, a new product, a new this versus, you know, sort of this basic security hygiene and doing the basic stuff. Um, so I think that's a yeah. zero trust in AI this this month is what it is. I think next month it's supposed to be ML is going to take that one. That's right. Then there'll be uh, I remember fuzzy. Remember fuzzy logic. Whatever happened to fuzzy logic? I was I was yeah, like that. I right. Most of my logic was fuzzy. Remember fuzzy logic was going to be in every windshield wiper. The windshield wipers would decide when to come on and when how fast to go. Whatever happened to them? They have that now, but it doesn't Tesla work very well. <laughs> yeah, Tesla bought it and it doesn't work great. Yeah. So then from, from Entrust, that's when Gardner came calling. And um, Entrust was losing out to VeriSign. I knew that was going to, the, the less religious approach, VeriSign's approach of getting certificates in the browsers and the sort of lightweight security was going to win out. So I went to Entrust, where I, re- I mean, uh, Gardner, where I really got to work with businesses. You know, that's what I did. Half the week, half the hours of the week were spent talking to businesses, trying to help them make security decisions. And it, <clears throat> after many years of that, I started to realize, you know, all these companies, they have the same access to information. They all have Gartner subscriptions. They can do, search the internet. Within an industry, they all spend about the same amount of money on security. You know, within an industry, banking spends more mm-hmm. than education, obviously, but colleges roughly spend about the same banks. They're all within a few percentage points of security as a percent of IT or security as a percent of revenue or however you want to measure it. But some of them are in the press getting broken into big time constantly while their direct competitor did not, you know, Target became a, mm-hmm. a poster boy for getting broken into, but Walnut, Walmart had the same vulnerability, same issues, did not. What's the difference? And I began to realize the difference was the cybersecurity teams, you know, the people I was talking to on the phone, you could tell the difference, right? The quality of the people, the, the their ability to not just know security, but their ability to work across security, across IT, and with the business side of things. There's CISOs that you could just tell they're not going to be in the news. They're working with app dev to get vulnerabilities out. They're already working with procurement on supply chain security or third-party risk management before it became a buzzword. And that's when I finally called Alan Paller at, at SANS and said, hey, you got anything fun for me to do? And that's that's why I went to SANS because you know, that's obviously SANS is a big training company. So I get to work but, at SANS. John, and- what I hear you saying is that the spend on products and how good or not good those products are didn't have as much of an impact on security as it sounds like like the process and the teamwork have an impact on security and that's often what i found interviewing pen testers for example yeah process you know obviously there's the trade of people process and technology so the skills of the people mm-hmm. it takes skilled people to put in place critical processes effective processes that are going to meet the business needs and be secure enough right not be the perfect security but be secure enough and, it, you know, for example, this was back when I worked at Entrust. I worked with, no, it was a TIS in the firewall world, a big insurance company helping them architect how they were going to connect to the Internet and start uh, putting firewalls in place. And we did a you know a big audit of what the existing connections they had. And essentially, they did a pretty good job. They're connected to a lot of third party people through proprietary connections. But they had this one big honking T1 that came right through from the outside, went right into their internal super sensitive systems now you we say said, oh, big, you say big honking t1 because like back then that was a lot of bandwidth it was 1.15 megabits a second is that right yeah like 1.2 right? megabits per second 24 voice channels was a honking <clears throat> connection right yeah well we said you got to do something about that that's insecure and they said no that goes directly to the auto glass company people who break their windshields can call the auto glass company and it automatically files a claim it saves us so much money to do this mm-hmm. that that connection is we are not going to touch that connection. And we finally convinced them you could put some controls on it, you know, firewall it and still allow what they needed to allow through. But that was a you know, key sort of business decision to mm-hmm. say, no, 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 we got to take that risk because if we had to start filing every dopey chip window claim directly with our agents, it would, it would cost you know, an arm and a leg. So, um, so at Sands, yeah, get to do that with a lot of uh, larger companies. The reason I wanted to sort of hop through every one of these decisions I made to change, there's a couple key things. You know, a lot of it was 
um, lateral moves. I didn't always jump to a higher salary when I made these changes, but I always had more fun in the place I went to. And I always mm -hmm. learned a boatload of stuff. And I always tell that to people starting out their careers or in their middle of their careers, you know, that the, our, our skills are in such scarcity. It's easy to make a lot of money. Um, and if that's what you want, that's what you want, you know, but um, it's a, it, the ability to have fun and make a lot of money at the same time is there. If you take advantage of some of the opportunities where you'll have curiosity and ability to learn and ability to do stuff and look at the, look at the quality of people you're going to work with. What did you do uh, at Sands, John? So at Sands, I do a bunch of a variety of things. I do some direct revenue things, you know, like help them work with vendors and webinars and things. But a lot of what I do is sort of uh, work with bigger Sands customers on what's the CISOs, what's their hot issues? And usually have yearly projects. Alan Paller and I, before he passed away, used to do a lot of this. And one of the cool things I helped him start up was this thing called CyberStart at Sands that was Alan's real legacy, which is to get more people, more kids into cybersecurity. So Sands gives away training courses um, to kids who pass a test. And the test is really a game. You know, it's a gaming oriented thing. If you can figure out somebody stealing the trees in Norway, they're breaking into the, the computer systems and the, stealing the trees in Norway. How did they do it? And it's got baby, uh, you know, baby exercises for figuring out what happened in Windows and look at this log and so on. Anyway, we found if they score high enough on this test, this game, they would pass, they would be able to take a SANS, you know, 100 level, entry level um, cybersecurity class and pass. This game was very accurate in predicting that. And so uh, we give it away free. Um, we work with community colleges and now we get kids uh, can get a two year degree with the community college, get doing all the boring social studies type stuff and, and the SANS courses for cybersecurity and they get to get hired with a two year degree and a certificate basically. But other things were like, I spent a, about a year and a half working with CISOs on and board and interviewing board of directors, boards of directors, how to communicate. How can CISOs communicate better to board of directors? How can we get board of directors, understand what board of directors can and cannot do? Because there's a lot of these myths in cybersecurity that if we could just convince management that security is the most important thing. No, that's not the case. They're, they have lots of things they need to run the business and they have things to do. They have strategy they have to worry about, not tactics. Another couple of years I spent on supply chain. Um, this was something the FBI uh, ma management class that I taught at, talked at, was uh, very interested in. They bring in outside CISOs and the FBI tries to indoctrinate them. Hey, share share your threats with us and we'll share you some cool threat information we see and, and also take you to the Quantico, Virginia for this academy. Um, so it's a lot of, lot of those special type project type, type things uh, just to help out the larger SANS customers and, and other things just sort of dip my toes in where our customers need help. John, does the business really dictate how much security appetite that they have and construct their organization accordingly? Or is that also a recipe for disaster? Well, I think what happens is, you know, businesses were here, most businesses were here anyway, before the, the computers and the internet, before internet anyway. Um, and they develop a risk culture or risk appetite. You know, there's some some hotel companies that really take chances and real estate goes bad and they lose a boatload of money and all of a sudden their hotels are closing down. There's others who are more conservative. Uh, there's insurance companies that were slow to adopt, um, you know, electronic uh, um, sign up for policies and things and there are others who are fast. And so they, they, most companies, large or small, based on their founders or based on you know how they get started, they have a risk appetite. It's hard to define. It's not a quantifiable thing. And that translates into their cybersecurity risk appetite. You know, they, they um, uh, as they've started to realize they had to worry about, you know, but, but by the way, before I get to cybersecurity risk, what most boards of directors realized was IT risk mm -hmm. is enormous. You know, for years, the most expensive um, disastrous events involving IT were when, when uh, SAP projects failed. Mm -hmm. There was a year when I think it was m and or uh, whoever makes M&Ms, one of those family owned chocolate companies, they didn't get their candy in the 7-Elevens for Halloween. And that cost them billions of dollars, bigger than any security incident. So boards began to see that IT was risky. The projects mm -hmm. might fail. And then these uh, things would go, they would overrun and cost lots of money. So they began to see, depending on their risk appetite, IT had to be considered, but it wasn't as quantifiable as financial risk, right? Right. I don't know if you, you guys remember when we tried to do generally acceptable security principles, kind of like they have generally acceptable accounting principles. Mm. So the oh, finance world, that way, huh? 
<laughs> you know, in the finance world, things are much more rigid. And you could say, I have this loan portfolio. It matures over this time period. I know when the risk is. Of, I can say whenever the rates go up or down, what our risk is or currency trading. Whereas in security, we say, yeah, here's the vulnerabilities. Bad guys could exploit them in two minutes or two years. We don't really know when they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. So the, the translating cybersecurity risk into their language was always a tough thing to do. But again, once they started to see the risks of IT in general, um, that paved the way. And a lot of uh, directors, like we're doing some things now, um, commenting on this SEC proposal about they want to they want to put uh, into all the uh, the uh, SEC disclosure forms publicly traded companies have to provide. Does the board have any cybersecurity expertise on the board? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? What does it mean to have cybersecurity expertise? Does it mean you have a degree? Does it mean you have a certificate? Does it mean you were a CISO? I mean, that's back to sort of this quality of people thing that, that's harder to judge. But so in companies, when what I found is the most successful, and this was based on a lot of talking to boards, the ones who said, oh, yeah, our CISO does a great job. The CISO was reporting on risk very similar to how the business was reporting on risk. Um, you know, maybe it was a heat map. Here's the biggest risk on our critical systems. Here's little, little risk on non-critical system. Maybe it was red, yellow, green. Maybe it was trend charts. And so the... the um, the most successful sort of um, where companies have been ahead of the curve on thinking about security risk is where the CISO was able to talk about that in business language, mm -hmm. not expect to teach the board how to speak security language. Yeah, it, I, I guess <clears throat> the question I have, John, is, you know, you've got universities that are doing, I'm just going to pick on universities, not pick on, but use this as an example for a moment, right? You've got some that are doing really well in their cybersecurity programs. Then you've got other one. I think it was Lincoln College that had to close its doors and listed ransomware in a cybersecurity um, event that contributed to their closing down. Is that, in, in that case, it's probably poor business management in addition to poor cybersecurity management and hygiene that led to that, right? Yeah, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like, you know, what, 70% of restaurants fail within a few years, right? Mm -hmm. So the... The, the guys say, I want to, yeah, I'm really an English teacher, but I wanna, I've always wanted to run a restaurant. Well, they know nothing about the business. They know nothing. And then they fail. The other thing is just the, uh, the, the, the inequalities of scale, you know, so large. For, so, for example, Randy Marchani is a SANS instructor. He's been the yeah. CISO of Virginia Tech Virginia for many Tech. years. Yeah. Yeah. And they're a large statewide system and they have decent funding and they, Randy's a smart CISO who's was convinced, uh, you know, the management of the university system and the state in general that security is important. But some little podunk uh, private college in Virginia that can that has, uh, you know, two IT people, they're at a big disadvantage, right? They have yeah, a Randy, Randy's got a, and I've worked with Randy's team in the past, I'm going back 20 years now, right? But his IT security team was some very talented engineers. Um, but you, you're right, you go to a smaller not to say that the two IT people they have aren't talented engineers. Likely, if you're one of those two people and you're supporting IT and security for your whole organization, you're really talented, right? There's just not enough of you and enough of a infrastructure to support what you need to get done on a daily basis. Yeah, and then the the other is there's a there's an uh, I think it's changed a lot in the past five or six years, but unfortunately in security, there was a lot of CISOs who basically took the approach. We write policies, we tell them what not to do. If they do what we told them not to do and something goes wrong, we said, we told you not to do that, mm -hmm. right? So remember the days of don't use your personal computer to do this or that, yet there was no way of detecting if they were doing it. And we knew they had to use their personal computers, you know, well before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lot of that that got baked into, especially the smaller ones who basically said, yeah, the best we can do is policy. And we tell people what not to do and then if they violated, we we were covered. Well, no, that the the, the schools could still shut down. The, the customers' data still got out the door. Yeah, I feel so like that, that was a horrible idea, and I had heard that in my time in university. They were adopt this model of we're going to just develop policies and guidance and give that to the users, and like security is up to them since we have this open and free environment. Like it's up to them to apply the patches and secure configurations to their machines. And I mean, lo and behold. No, no one did that. <laughs> and that's how they got compromised. 
Well, you know, it's, it's, you mentioned uh, zero trust was mentioned, right? So the mm -hmm. zero trust is a term that came out of Forrester like 15 years ago. And it, before that, it was the borderless um, uh, initiative that was going to Jericho form that was going to say, we, we don't need firewalls. Every endpoint has to protect itself. Well, that'd be great if there weren't users using them. Right. But, but you know, the first implementation of what what to me is critical to zero trust was what we used to call network access control. You know, when mm -hmm. something connects to your network, check to see if it's one of your managed devices or not. Hey, this is John on his SANS PC. Okay, we have deep visibility. Wait a minute, this is John on his personal laptop. We don't have deep visibility and we're going to give him differential access. We'll put John on a different network segment than when he's on his home PC than, than uh, on his work PC. Well, if you remember back in the worm years, this is when we first started talking about this. When yep, I was there. Yep. I yeah, mean, when, the NAC vendors would market heavily to universities. And universities right. were hot to trot because I had all these things plugging into my network. And if it already had some kind of malware on it that spread as a worm, like we were doomed. Yeah, locally here, I think it was John Hopkins University. <laughs> they had pictures of kids. The students were getting uh, little wagons and they had to bring their PCs to yep. IT to get them checked. Yep, I remember that. But what, what failed back then was what NAC did, what Network Access Control did, was say, oh, you're missing patches you can't connect. And the user would say, it's not my job to put these patches on. Isn't that mm -hmm. IT's job? What are you talking about? Right. So that's the, you know, that's the other and then, part. Of and then they'd go unplug the printer and plug their computer into it. Yeah. Right. Or, you know, in the old days, they'd find the uh, fax modem and connect yep. to AOL and and get out to get out that way. Um so that that that's that's sort of when I hear zero trust today, it's it, in talking the government zero trust architecture. Until you've got that basic security hygiene in place, and until you have trust in identities, you know, today with passwords still so uh, prevalent and and phishing so prevalent, we can't even trust that that's really that user on that machine. You can't do all this fancy zero trust stuff till you have that basic foundation put in. And a lot of that stuff about connecting and deciding is this safe or let's make a risk decision and make a differential access decision. That's sort of key. And that's that's in places like a lot of universities since they were early. They were way ahead of the game for bring your own device or for the pandemic yeah. for people working home. <clears throat> yeah. And tr trusting devices and users in systems is interesting. As I've you know, been thinking about this week, I'm like, if you can't trust the software that boots your operating system, how can you really have zero trust? Isn't zero trust a component of all of the different security solutions at all these different levels? But if I can't trust the firmware level, as an example, then I don't really have zero trust. Well, yeah, that's where you get to this turtle on top of turtle thing. And if you can't trust the bottom turtle, you mm -hmm. know, then the rest of the turtles, are, you can't trust them easier. But at some point, you know, we've, we have definitely seen hardware vulnerabilities in, in the microprocessors that screw everything up, but they're usually harder to exploit. So at some point, mm -hmm. we know there's ways we can do pretty secure boot ups, or at least, you know, good enough secure boot ups. But then we have then this whole world of applications. You know, we IT grew up in a world where users need when at Gartner, this was a, a real number that I first I didn't believe that if a company of say 10,000 people users did a survey, they would always find at least 1000 applications in use one 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 application for every 10 users that had business justification not just that the user brought in and was playing a game but that the graphics department needed or the finance mm -hmm. department needed and that was the old days right that was when the pc was chock full of fat applications and the browser came along and sort of became the universal client for applications and all of a sudden users did not need all those applications yet windows would let them install anything, right? The cell phone world, iPhones and Android came along, concept of the app store and sandboxes and things being built in to limit what the user could do. Unfortunately, the PC generation grew up and Microsoft fostered this. No, no, put the power in the hands of the desktop and the user, let them do anything. And then, uh, oh, wait a minute, Bill Gates got security religion in what was it, 2001 or two when he wrote mm -hmm. his famous letter? <clears throat> mm-hmm. I was just uh, it had a something about Microsoft Word. I had all those features. Like it still doesn't really work great. Like you want to resize the image and have text go around it. Like yeah, good luck. <laughs> I like where a friend of mine said, and this was with his work. He's at home working on his work PC, and he said, "I just got a thing for Microsoft. Should I upgrade my Windows 10 work PC to Windows 11?" 
I said, well, there's a lot of things wrong with what you're asking me. First off, what does your company think about that? And they say, oh, yeah, we can do it. I'm like, oh, great. They've let the users do upgrades. Mm. I said, secondly, Windows 11 pretty much just moves the cheese around. There's some security improvements, but why would you want to upgrade these? Because it's because it's the newest version. Shouldn't right. it be on the newest version? We, we, most of us know better. Well, at least we know better, but we don't always act better. Right, Tyler? I think, Tyler, you did exactly yeah. that, right? You went to Windows 11 and you were like, oh, no. Yeah, there's a, there's a few. There's, the security was great, so I was all for it. I got to test, you know, I needed to test a lot more payloads. But, yeah, for production, should have probably uh, done that dev testing a little more. My, my DevOps was off. <laughs> well, that's, you know, the, my grandfather migrated from Italy to Manhattan. And the, the, the legend goes that he lost all his money playing three-card Monty when he landed in Manhattan and came across a three-card Monty game. And, you know, here all these years later, the users still fall, people still fall for scale. People are hopeful. You know, we're a hopeful species and people hope this upgrade. Or, gee, maybe that tough phone call really is Microsoft doing remote support. And mm. Maybe I really should give them out. So this idea that users will, every machine will protect itself and users will all of a sudden no longer fall for scams. As long as there's lights left on in Las Vegas, we know that's not going to be the case. Right. John, <clears throat> your time at Gartner, you talked to how many cybersecurity companies did you talk to, you think, and do briefings with? Well, um, it's, it's impossible to count because originally, you know, there was maybe a uh, hundred, you would say, mm -hmm. say, you know, you know, when I started the biggest, um, who do, let's say, the biggest, highest market share, top two market shares of antiviral software were IBM and Computer Associates. Mm -hmm. Now there's, uh, you got to use uh, eight point type just to list the antiviral vendors on a, on a typical screen. So the, the, a couple of things exploded. I mean, the, the, the good things is good new products came along, you know, mm -hmm. that, that do good stuff. Um, the bad thing is there's no way to judge these products on which are better than the others, let alone which do any, you know, for example, you mentioned machine learning, pretty much machine learning is like, you know, turmeric or whatever wonder ingredients out there. It's in everything now. Mm. And everybody will show you demonstrations of, you know, look, my machine learning detected every attempt of this malware to, um, trying to break in. I said, well, look, what's the false positive rate? Can you show me that? Oh, no, we don't, we don't test for the false positive rate. So the vendor side was, was exploding. Um, and the um, that's you know which isn't always a bad thing. There's always consolidation, but what wasn't keeping up were what you know what if, what's funny. What happened was things like remember we used to have four or five tech uh, like uh, network world, computer world, um, all these magazines that would do tests and reviews yeah. of things. Yes, we lost that, and so now you see it to do things. Miter Miter's doing some cool things around the this ingenuity unit of theirs with the attack testing against the scenarios and showing you what different products do and don't do and not trying to put value judgment on them. But it's really hard for the world out there to judge what's better. So what they tend to do is say, what's everybody else like me using? Mm -hmm. You know, some smaller university of Virginia Tech will say, I'm going to go ask Randy Marchani what he's using. And that's sort of what we ended up, we, what I really did at Gardner was, you know, I talked to lots of enterprises who, who would tell us, I really hate these Juniper firewalls. They used to be great. They suck now. I'm, I'm looking at, uh, you know, Palo Alto networks. What do you think? And we'd have got briefed and formed an opinion. But soon, within a month, I'd have heard from, a, you know, dozens of people who love Palo Alto and also believe Juniper sucked mm -hmm. in, in firewalls at the time. So there's, there's sort of this, there's a reason everybody goes to RSA conferences, not just to watch all those PowerPoints and, and go to San Francisco. It's to talk to other people like themselves and find out what they're doing. Do so you think there's... Of, kill go ahead, Tyler. I was going to say, doesn't that kind of kill innovation though? Like I, I have seen that a little bit where it almost, almost becomes a pay to play or, you know, the market adoption is what drives, drives the industry. So the innovation tends to get <laughs> swallowed up and or not uh, seen for things that actually are doing amazing, amazing things. And yet they can't seem to get out of a basement. Yeah. You know, that was one of the reasons I left Gardner it actually had to do with when magic quadrants were done well, they were really useful, but when they're not done well, they just tend to reward the big guys, you know, the ones with the big revenue and the innovators, the ones that, you know, challengers and in other positions have a tougher time coming in. Again, I think, think some of that's changing. I don't think those, those sources like Forrester and Gardner have that as much sway anymore. 
as we start to see this sort of newer generation come in and also see the rise of these like innov innovators, sandboxes and um, a lot of the bigger CISO, you know, Jim Ralph is a great example when he was CISO at Aetna. Yeah, great sandbox active. program. Yeah. Yeah. And he was very active in saying, hey, you got to take some risks to make advances and you mm -hmm. got to look into these key technologies. But yeah, the, some of that does say, well, what's the safe choice? So that little college that went out of business could say, well, we chose a firewall that was in the upper right, you know. Mm. Uh, but the um, I I do think that what a lot of the approaches that were taken, what we were trying to rely on regulations for security, you know, like piece pay, payment card industry, they made some advances in retail security, got everybody up to a basic level, and got encryption of specific types of data finally started, but they had things in there like every every server should have antiviral on it which made no sense at all. It was a giant waste of money when you could have been doing other better things and saying, we're going to do, a, you need to invest in threat hunting to quickly detect when something gets in. So it's not just- But also, of I agree though, like with PCI, I think PCI was great in that it was a data security standard and its greatest achievement, my not so humble opinion, is it taught people how to protect cardholder data to make it more difficult for attackers to obtain it. That doesn't necessarily mean like they had a firewall or like you're saying, John had antivirus software on every server. It means they didn't store as much credit card data or as much of that data on a single swipe as they did before. Therefore, it wasn't hanging around and attackers couldn't get it. It's not their security improved greatly. It's a process improved for how they handled the data. But to me, that moved the needle to help curb credit card fraud. I mean, you see it today. It's evidenced by attackers do ransomware and cryptocurrency mining rather than steal credit cards. I mean, not 100%, but that's the way the trend is going. Well, you know, and it did an interesting thing, too. You know, over my years at Gardner and then Sands, I've done a good number of board of directors briefings. And back in those days of PCI, it enabled this, the good CISOs mm -hmm. to go to the board and go to, or even not to the board, go to the chief legal counsel and say, hey, there is this thing, we could be fined for this PCI thing. And we we need we don't need to use this credit card data everywhere we're using it. But the damn marketing group says, no, 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 no. We need that number for these marketing campaigns so we can we can use the card number to find out where the person lives and what they do and blah, blah, blah. So it, it, the, the good CISOs were able to go beyond, okay, we gotta be compliant with PCI. How do we reduce the cost of that? To saying, hey, how do we get a toehold in here in doing data security right? You know, mm -hmm. similar to uh, some of the privacy things that the states of California in particular right. are putting up. GDPR. Saying, yeah. hey, this can solve us a lot of privacy problems across states if we are encrypting more data. So, the you know, my big hope is we start to see what the federal government's doing and what the Google and Microsoft and Apple and finally got together to agree on common, strong, two-factor authentication, you know, protocols, the FIDO stuff. Do the same thing with sort of um, chomp, finally making progress on getting rid of reusable passwords is the sole form of yeah and I, I feel like the good the good CISOs know how to use compliance standards to push security like specific security initiatives in the right direction right because they you know PCI for example says a lot of things like you should have a pen test you should I mean it even mentions firmware security in there it mentions patches and all that stuff I think it's a good starting point to push security in very strategic directions there's a lot more to that equation as most of us know right but it is a good opportunity to do that to use compliance as a driver for security yeah and that is one of the things again in this boards of directors communications it helps you put things in their language mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know it's hey it's going to reduce our re regulatory risk they understand regulatory right. risk most whether even if you're not in financial almost all companies have some form of regulatory risk but it is amazing how hard it is to cross some of these bridges you know I just looked this up because I, I did a, a a federal news radio interview back in 2006. I did a Gardner research note because the FDA put out guidance to medical device manufacturers to say you should patch your devices if they're running on Windows, which many were running on embedded Windows way back then. Even um, you won't have to re go through recertification of your device. It's up to you to say the material function did not change. Uh, but we had to patch it for to reduce the security risk, and therefore we're going to take that risk. And you see, the, the device industry said, "Whoa, no, we're not doing that. We're not taking any risk. What if what if something bad did happen, and it turned out it was because we patched it?" So, so the 
these compliance regulations, finally, we just now here, 15 years later, the FDA is uh, putting in the pre, when, when vendors submit the package of documentation to get a new device approved, they have to address cybersecurity upon submission instead of it always being after the products on the market. So that's the other area where uh, regulations can help when they finally wake up and start to say, no, it's gotta be built in um, versus added on. And that's another way you know, we can see that that vast number of security vendors maybe start to shrink when more things are baked in and less security is required to be added, spackled on top. <clears throat> Does that also come down to a bill of materials, John? But having that bill of materials be a living document and held to a certain standard because i think my 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 gripe if it were to be here's the bill of materials and like that's it well like what are you doing to update the software that's on there and the bill of materials that went with it it should be a living document right sure so you're sneakily getting working your way over to the supply chain side of things yeah. and the software bill of materials <clears throat> so it's a it's a it's a great idea this idea that every piece of software would have attached to it a bill of materials that says if any libraries, other components came from it and, and which version was was pulled in and all that, that that's really valuable stuff. And I, I think it's going to, it really is going to start to help. But there's one, to me, the major obstacle is still, uh, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but enterprise broken, enterprise basic security hygiene. So think about it. What's the most important software bill of materials to start with? What's, what apps am I even using in my enterprise? Mm. What am I trying to protect? What's what's my asset inventory? You know, you do a you do a vulnerability scan or a, you know a full pen test or anything, and you find all the apps that are running in a company, and then you tell IT, and they say, no, 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 those aren't in the configuration management database. Those don't count. Well, what what what? You know, so typical company, if it knows seventy five to eighty percent of what apps are running on its network, that's they're doing pretty good. Yeah, I agree. It's about usage, right? And there are some vendors that do a better job, I think, than others at not just telling you what you have, but what's being used. Yeah, and that's starting the you know, the coolest trend I've seen in the past three or four years, it's, it's at SANS, is um, quite often software architects, as people went to, you know, pipe CICD type pipelines and DevOps and things and these privacy issues were being raised. Software architects are starting to say, well, we got to bake privacy requirements into our product. We got to consider that. That's a requirement that we have to address. Hey, security, you want to get involved. So then in the, the sort of younger CISOs um, are, are fluent in that. And they're sort of getting um, security and app dev working together at the start to get more things baked in. And I think things like SBOM, so Software Bill of Materials, is a is a great example of that'll that'll flow pretty quickly. Stronger authentication, um, getting um, vulnerability testing tools baked into standard software test and dev environments, so you know a build can't can't get promoted and unless it's got a clean bill of health and so on. Mm -hmm. The um, that they, they're starting to be some more of that that the this, the app dev software architect side is is seeing some of these harder elements, not the not the real crazy, not the real ones that are the bad guys use to exploit things, but the some of the key sort of um, some basic security hygienes that if they were baked into the apps, if the apps started up assuming it was in an insecure state and 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 um, you know, kept things as clean, you know, like imagine when when Amazon first put out S3, if it had, back then it started with uh, everything was secure when it started up and had to be opened up instead of the the other way around. Mm -hmm. So so that trend of sort of privacy requirements and and to some extent secureness of, of applications or trust in applications or protecting my kids or protecting my privacy starting to be a, a competitive factor. I know they don't have a chance in hell against Google, but who would have thought that DuckDuckGo, GoDuck, whatever that, that browser Duck, is, Duck, go, yeah. DuckDuckGo would still be around. I remember using that and saying, this is fun, but it's, it'll be gone in a week and it's, mm -hmm. it's here years later. Yeah, um, do you see the ability for some of these larger companies, like let's take, you know, fortune 5,000 companies. Do you see their ability to get to this, the maturity model necessary in order to protect themselves against today's adversaries and the, the type of attacks we're seeing? Like, do you see that as a possibility? I think that was one of the big selling points of, of zero trust, right? Like and an enterprise that's multi-continental uh, international has, you know, several thousand or hundred thousand users getting a hold on just applications, like one level of, of these general basic hygiene things that we think about, 
is kind of well outside of, of their capability. So do you think that there is a way for these big companies to begin to get to that point or are we too far behind and we have to come up with something more innovative in order to uh, provide the level of protection they need for today's adversaries? Man, I just like that story about my grandfather for, falling for three card Monty. You know, it's, it's always going to be a, a race, right? It's always going to be a, they make a move, we make a move. Yeah, I, I, I used to, I think I, I like to claim that I was the first one who said we got to move away from whack-a-mole and move to more like chess, you know, where you think moves ahead. But then I realized the problem is in, in, in the cyber world, the attacker, you know, chess is a bounded problem. That uh, IBM computer could beat the chess master because chess is a bounded problem. And in, in cybersecurity, we don't have a bounded problem. The, the bad guys don't have to have a horse that can only move two forward and one over. And they can run around to the other side of the board and come up to the bottom of the board if they want. So there's certainly advantages that's, the bad guys have. And that, that's, because, uh, that's because the technology, right? And, and how complicated our networks are, are getting, how complicated and the more demand even consumers are, are requiring from you know, simple things with inside their life. They want their phone to be able to do any, anything and everything at, at a click of a button instantly and still be secure. So I think we, we are fighting that that battle of chess where creativity is the only limitation, but the demand from consumers and the demand from even maintaining an edge with inside a business forces that innovation and technology drive at the Occam's razor speed without the security coverage to catch that up. So again, I, I think you're correct. We do have to kind of play this in a different creative manner, but that innovation piece is where I always come back to. We don't have enough of the creativity. We're trying to, you know, relabel something, rebrand something that's been done for 30 years, uh, just being called something different. We've, we've got to do this much better, much faster, I think. Yeah, I think, the, I think what needs to happen though is we need to get the easy problems out of the way so the innovation can focus on the hard problems. You know, again, reusable passwords. You know, if you got rid of reusable passwords or limited them, so 80% of you know, what Microsoft did, they, they looked at 300 million logins to their cloud services and, and of the phishing attempts, you know, 99.9% .9 would not have worked, obviously, if, if there was two-factor authentication. Yes, somebody can hack around two-factor authentication, but we got them down into the, the, the small percentage of the problem zone. You know, the numbers I, I always look for in cybersecurity, we, we're nowhere near having in retail, you know, retail is like the oldest industry, right? Cavemen probably sold rocks to each other. They've had statistics for many years on on uh, shrinkage, employee theft, and shoplifting. Yeah, loss and prevention, they're... right? We haven't gotten to that well, level in cybersecurity, John. You're right. And and in in retail, loss prevention and shrinkage, roughly is always around one and a half percent of yep. revenue, and the industry roughly spends one and a half percent to keep it there. Right. So three percent of revenue in retail is lost to shrinkage and employee theft. And if, if, if shrinkage goes up to 2%, then they spend more to bring it back down, but they mm -hmm. don't say, let's get shrinkage down to 0.5% and we'll spend 10% to do so. Right. Cause that and, doesn't make sense. That's a great analogy. Right, John. Wasting yeah. the company's yeah. money. So you, it's hard to do that in the, the world we're in because we haven't solved the basic problems. You know, again, make it so, and again, I, I, I'm a, been a big fan since it's days of NSA, the critical security controls and this idea of basic security hygiene, here's the things pen testers say, makes it harder for me to attack. Then you, then if you do these next 10 things, it's even harder, you know, then do that kind of thing. And then does that mean nobody will ever be able to break in? No, of course not. As you pointed out, the complexity of the networks and the things we're doing, there's always going to be opportunities. But, you know, to see, to see um, CVEs that are still talking about buffer overflows or unchecked variables or, you know, all these ones that have been known for so many years, it, we, before we need to worry about super de duper innovation, we really need to worry about operations. You know, yeah, not just it's like we can't we can't escape some of those problems. Like we see them and we try and remediate them, but then they crop back up in other ways. Like the buffer overflow John, is a great example. It's been around, as you pointed out at the beginning of this interview, since the beginning of computing. There have been buffer overflows, right? But we're still dealing with those in modern systems today. Now, granted. They've taken on many different shapes and forms, and the more code we write, the more of them we have. So it's, it's that moving target problem that's, that's hard to bring it down to a safety level of loss prevention. Or I you know, gave the example of electronics. Most of my TVs don't fall off the wall or catch on fire. I'm sure there's a percentage that do, but most of them don't, right? So you can go to a lot of other industries and talk about how safety has been effective. But in cybersecurity, it is such a moving target. Is that our number one challenge? 
Well, I, I think, you know, again, <coughs> excuse me, again, getting back to, uh, to me, the, how much more can we get built into the software and the network side of things? So one of the coolest things, I think it was Netflix. Are they the ones who built the chaos monkey? Yes. Yeah. So it's, this, you know, this idea of let's test the app and there are all kinds of weird conditions. And if it didn't get a response here and do a better job of trying every failure mode, we're going to live in a chaos monkey world. You know, that it's not going to get less chaotic. It's not going to go back to the mainframe. It's, it's just going to get more complex. It's that's the way it's going to go. So as these smart people are innovating in sort of the test tools and the things, the things to build into applications to deal with anomalies and, you know, maybe the bad guy's on the network and he's trying to get the data, but or trying to do this and that, but we can uh, do things right in the software um, to, I think to, to focus back. To me, that's that's the one side, of, that's the big side of innovation. The second, the next is on the operations side, the IT operations side. If they can, as things move to the cloud and as we start using all these new methodologies, and you can already see, you know, in the, in the, um, this whole supply chain thing and the need for SBOM, that as they've started to pull in open source components and libraries and work it in, they did the same old things they did in the old days of just putting untested code in, you know. So that whole op that whole operation side of things, then the security innovation can come along, I think, in the really key areas around data protection. You know, I, I did a thing, we, we, we were getting yelled at in security constantly. Hey, you dummies, it's all about the data. Why are you doing all this spending all this money, you should be protecting the data. We tried to protect the data. We had encryption and PKI before we had most of all these fancy technologies, but it broke the business. The business We couldn't work it into the way business did business and it was too intrusive. We couldn't have users be secure, secure logins so they could get their decryption keys. But as we start to see the, the uh, uh, better ability of applications to sort of protect themselves against the standard problems, that I think security innovation can get focused more on. All right, let's go back and protect the data. Yeah, I think people pick on me sometimes because they use the phrase "low hanging fruit" too much, but that's that's what I'm referring to, John. When I say "low hanging fruit," right? Defining what that is is often difficult and sometimes vertical, maybe technology process specific, right? But I think you're right. I think there there are several common standards to get the basics done. Now, that needs to be tweaked to your own business model. But once we get that that down, for most people, then we can start to be really innovative. Yeah, and one last thing uh, that I've seen that's pretty cool is on the security side, a lot of the innovation is also in tools that this, the SOC analysts and you know security people get to use and can use and can enhance and do things. So we did a little um, hiring manager survey. It wasn't a very big one, but I talked to the hiring managers versus you know tried to get a thousand of them respond and win an iPad, so I think it was valuable data. But I was trying to look at a couple of things, two things. When they when a when a SOC manager or you know somebody hiring into security hired somebody and then uh, what tools do they wish they knew how to use when they showed up at work the first day? Because they might be real smart. You know, it's not just that they had a degree. They really knew Windows internals. They could really do security stuff. But what actual tools? And so out of the top 10, top 12, 10 were open source tools, mm. you know, things like the Elk stack and then, then Nessus and all those kind of things, because that's what they were using in the SOC. And then, then we also asked about turnover, you know, uh, how, how, uh, how quickly are you losing employees? Because that's theoretically a very big thing in, in security, right? Everybody's job jumping, so it's a lot of turnover. The SOCs, and this is very specific, this, the operations side, the SOC managers that reported the highest use of open source tools had the lowest rate of attrition or turnover. That's interesting. And I say, you know, that, that sort of runs counter to dogma, right? We believe, well, if we're they're using these open source tools, if they'll jump to another company, we'll lose that expertise. But what it turned out was, you know, the SOC analysts that got to play around and add value to tools, they were they felt creative. They were it's more tools. fun. I agree. Yeah. I agree wholeheartedly. I think the reason I one of the reasons I love open source tools, it's more fun. And I hate to knock right. commercial vendors, especially the ones that sponsor this show. But it is, you're right. It's, it requires more creativity, engineering. And, and learning and 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 I don't want to discount commercial tools because they have their place obviously but I do find a certain joy of using open source tools because it's harder and I have to be more creative you know the uh, the sans labs every most sans courses the technical ones have a lab mm -hmm. that's in the afternoon it's hands on it all uses open source software because obviously we can't mm -hmm. can't buy licenses for everything when I when I uh, asked Alan Paller years ago, hey, you got anything fun for me to do to Sands? He said, come on down to our conference in D.C. 
I'll introduce you to the CEO. There was actually there's actually a like business side of Sands that has CEOs and things like that. So I went to their their conference at a big hotel at five o'clock, and there was nobody there. I was like, there's like a few people wandering around, and I'm like, man, this nobody's this is a horrible conference. Where is everybody? The RSA conference at five o'clock, or the mm-hmm. Gardner Security Conference at five o'clock. The hallways are jam packed with people. And he said, oh, they're all in the labs. We have to pry them out of the labs. It's you know seven o'clock at night and send them home. Mm-hmm. And that that program I mentioned, CyberStart, for the uh, 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 community college and high school kids. Same thing. We'd have kids showing up at eight in the morning and begging the lab manager to open up and let them come in and play with things. Mm-hmm. And so that that makes that's building the next generation of creative people. But even you know guys who are SOC analysts and are sitting there clicking on alerts all day, give them some time to play with tools and build tools. They they become builders and it is more fun. They feel creative and uh, yeah, I could get a, a raise if I went to that other company, but I wouldn't have this fun. That's right. That's an important missing missing facet though. I think as well is not allowing the history and uh, that kind of, I would say, community knowledge or uh, the cybersecurity history and knowledge, not letting any of those disappear. We have to keep those stories alive, keep the people uh, engaged in those things, because you start to look at, uh, you, were, you were saying some things around uh, the big problem with like a buffer overflow. Like, why do we still have that in there? Is that because we're failing to train the next generation and provide them with lessons learned so that they have a better starting point and they're not making the same mistakes or are we letting them make all the same mistakes and we're starting them back 30 years ago in a much more hostile environment. And I think that's an important key aspect that we really do have to not lose a lot of that historical value to pass on to the next generation so that we give them better leap points and we provide them with things that they don't have to continually make mistakes on. It's the same for an institution. Don't bring in a new person or fire a person and bring in a new person and then repeat the same mistakes you've already tried with just different tools. Those are, those are big problems. I, I see yeah. consistently not passing on. Yeah. You know, I did a t- testimony to Congress uh, years ago and they're asking about why is it so hard in security? And I told the story, you know, uh, I think it was a, a woman at Carnegie Mellon did a cool presentation on how did chemical engineering and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering, how did those get to be engineering disciplines? And when is software engineering or security engineering going to be an engineering discipline? What does it mean to be a... And it turns out that what it really means to be an engineering discipline is there's a table of material strengths. You know, so to build a bridge or to build a building a certain height, there's material strengths of concrete, of rebar, there's pre-existing designs, there's handbooks of designs for arches that have formulas for how much they can hold. You know, before mechanical engineering, here in Baltimore, I lived near Baltimore, to test the big bridge they built, the only way they could test bridges before they had these types of material handbooks was they would fill the bridge with locomotives because the locomotives were the heaviest thing. And if the bridge didn't fall down, they say, yeah, it must be safe, which of course led to that <clears throat> famous video of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge going like this when, when they didn't really know what they were doing. The problem we have in, in software is, again, there's no strength of materials. Is this form software strong enough? Is this library routine for doing this uh, currency conversion? Is it strong enough for the need? We don't have that. And I don't think we're going to have that anytime soon. So you're right. To some extent, the world we work in is a craft world. And the craftsmen pass that expertise on to the next generation. And the next generation improves things and starts to use automated tools. Hey, I don't need a foot pedal to turn the thing where I shape the vase. I can have a motor that turns it at a precise speed. And I can focus more on getting a better vase and ultimately, you know, automate. So I think that's where we are in, still in the evolution of security is we need that, that you're, you're definitely right. We need that craftsman ability to pass the, the knowledge on and then uh, have the automated tools and basic security hygiene, get rid of the, the repetitive stuff. So the, the innovation can come out. Joe, I'm going to ask you a question along the lines of vendors and evaluating solutions. And have you read good to great by Jim Collins? Yeah. So what separates the good security companies from the great security companies in your experience? Oh boy. The, um, you know, when I decided to leave Gardner, one thing I looked at was going to a venture capital company and mm. a lot of them, you know, funding small security vendors. And I, I hate to say it, but it's almost like the best companies are the opposite of what the venture capitalists are looking for. So um, the example I'll use is, there's been some small security vendors that were slow to go public 
And the uh, Wall Street guys or the venture capitalist guys would make fun of him. They would say, oh, yeah, that's CEO. He's a lifestyle CEO. Yeah. He doesn't want to go. I said, what does that mean? Oh, all he wants is happy customers. That's the difference. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, they like to the put company, lab- they like to put labels on people and companies in, in the VC world. I think out of necessity. Right. But that's not necessarily well, whether it's a good or great security company. It's out of necessity for their world where yes. three out of, you know, three, two of three could go under as long as they get one double and one mm-hmm. triple and maybe a home run every now and then they're okay. Uh, but, but what I would do when there's, there's security, there's CEOs of small startups that are focused on the uh, sort of, yeah, this is what everybody needs. Well, how do you know? Have you talked to, no, 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 I, we, this is what we have. And this is because we have it, everybody needs it. Then there's others, you know, the ones I can point to. Like, But wait, I want to go back to those CEOs, and I don't want to knock their vision or their enthusiasm, but also realize that not everyone is the Steve Jobs of software and and computer design. Like, Steve was in Apple, like, that was just a recipe for success in creating new categories and telling people what they need. And that's that's the exception, not really the, the rule. That's a hard path. Yeah, and in, in our world, I think it's even harder because the the problems companies have to solve are the problems right now. It's not a consumer yeah. world. Yes, you're right. It's not as faddish. So you know the the near zooks of the world. You could when mm-hmm. when Palo Alto when he first started Palo Alto, he knew there was a problem in the old way of firewalls doing things, and he used to come heckle us at Gardner conferences when we would talk about firewalls before anybody heard of Palo Alto. The guy, I forget their names now, but the guys who founded um, FireEye were the same way with this sandbox type stuff yep, they had. Yep. You know, it's so funny. The, I sat in a conference room with Nier and one of the other founders, and they presented their vision for Palo Alto. And I was like, if you guys can make that work, you're going to have something really special and you're going to win in the market. And damn it, I wish I had my checkbook to be an investor back then, right? <laughs> yeah. So that to me, that's the big, that's hard for a typical enterprise to mm. judge, right? But that's, there's a, there's, um, when, when the, as I said, when the magic quadrant process was working right at Gardner and you could express your opinion, an analyst could express their opinion on a company and <laughs> excuse me, work that kind of thing in, um, the, 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 that was much more valuable because, you know, the typical enterprise, they can't go interview every CEO. Right. But the, when they're looking at, to me, in, in our world, it's pretty hard for uh, the next product to be revolutionary. Mm-hmm. This was, uh, oh boy, I forget his name now. He was the CISO at Pepsi. And he, I stole this line from him many years ago. He said, I want a security vendor that comes to me and says, here's how you should spend your first security dollar, not your next security dollar. Hmm. So the, the companies I would tend to ignore, or the question I would always ask when a new company was giving me a briefing on their solution was, okay, if I buy you, what do I stop buying? Mm-hmm. And the answer was, oh, no, defense in depth. No, no, no. You add us. No, no, no. Think of retail. Imagine if every time retail came up with a way to keep you from shoplifting something, we'd have Snickers bars with uh, hubcaps attached to them. So you couldn't steal Snickers bars and nobody would buy Snickers bars. So you can't right. just say, just keep adding more and more layers for security. Right. Retail, but retail mean? space is the same way. You, there's only so much space on the shelf. Sure. And the same with, you know, when when things get, when, um, there, there was a while when Nier was started up Palo Alto where he really didn't want to call it a firewall mm. because he'd be competing with Checkpoint. Right. But then you realize, no, it, it's a better firewall. You know, we, we all know about Moore's Law, right? That technology gets more and more power, you know, chips got more and more powerful each year and, and cost less and, and or they, they stayed the same power, but they cost less and consume less electricity. The same has to be true in security. There's better ways of doing things and we have to replace some things. You know, DLP data loss prevention is a great example. If we were encrypting everything, we would be replacing a lot of DLP spending because we, we would know the data was routinely encrypted and kept encrypted um, persistently. Um, but things like perimeter security, it's not going to get replaced. It's not going to go disappear. It's going to do things better for the same price, or it's going to be a lot cheaper for smaller companies that get equal power. And then those same forces are slowly at work in the security market that and that's why a lot of vendors go away because they're just doing something. It'd be really good if it, um, it would it would add to security, but it would also add to my cost, and I can't have thirteen agents running on every endpoint. Mm. John, I 
we could continue in this conversation, but we're unfortunately we're out of time. I do have five questions left for you. Are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Sure. Is this like uh, my favorite dirty word kind of thing? Sort of. Sort of. Yeah, there's no right or wrong answer. They're just five silly questions. Three words to describe yourself. Um, balding, bicyclist, security person. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Boy, I've always liked that, uh, what do they call it, a scythe, that curve mm. thing and slice somebody's head off. I think that'd be mine. If you were to book about yourself, what would the title be? I have no idea why I did that, but it worked out pretty well. What is your favorite hacker movie? Oh, you know, I'm going to skew old here because it was the first one I ever saw. And I'm going to have to say War Games. I, w I was either going to guess War Games or Sneakers now. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm yeah, guessing. No, guessing. I'll never forget the, the computer being the thwarted by making you play tic-tac-toe. Right. <clears throat> Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. You know, my father was sort of reminds me of Ed Asner. So I'd have to pick Ed Asner to be my father. And mm. um, Let's see. My mother was... Um, Probably like, um, I hate to say it, but Katy Perry. That's an interesting combination. John, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. All right. Great to be here. Enjoyed it, Paul. With that, we'll take a short break and come up next with the security news. Stay tuned.